Turn to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Uh, I, I want to, as we, as we kind of walk through this again, you know, I've kind of done it out of order because we started the first of it and then we looked at the second half um, of it at the same time so that we could kind of get a grasp of what he was talking about. But we're going to circle back into the middle of Colossians looking at particularly verses um, uh, 11 through 15 this morning. But in order to do that, I wanted to make sure that we're all on the same track with the overview uh, that we're taking when we look at this. And so you'll have some of that outline in your notes and they'll be on the overhead and we'll talk about it uh, a little bit more. Uh, just need to say my wife isn't here because she's packing up the car because we are married for 29 years today. And so we get to go celebrate a little bit this weekend. And, um, and so as I was reflecting on it, I just had no idea whenever I knelt for us to take communion on the stage at Christ Community Church when I was 20 years old how much you all would be part of the story that God was weaving into my life. And I, we are just so grateful that we here and we've been able to serve here for 20 something years. Uh, most of our marriage life, you all, this community has been a part of who we are. And so uh, I just wanna take a second and say thank you all to the way you've contributed to helping us get to this 29 year mark because there were moments when we weren't sure we would make it to this mark and so, but we have. Um, so uh, w whenever we look at Colossians, one of the things that's important for me to do, and, and, and if you start kind of thinking about in, in these ideas, uh, you'll, you'll see this thing really, really, I, I think, honed in on in some of the letters, particularly in the pre prison letters. You can see it here in Colossians and in Ephesians and in Philippians. You see it very, very uh, uh, overtly in in the book of Galatians, all of these that we think Paul probably wrote, but then this theme is very, very uh, in intimately articulated in the book of Hebrews. We don't know who the man or woman was that wrote that book, but that theme is most certainly uh, clearly present. And, and it's this theme that I want you to be mindful of. I just think that we do not talk enough about the way that the biblical literature has to be understood in the context of the covenants. I mean, do you, the word testament, does anybody in class today know what the word testament means? It just means covenant. It, it literally, they are synonymous terms. So when you look at your Bible and you see it divided between the Old Testament and the Old Covenant, what is being communicated in the way those writings are organized is the writings of the Old Covenant and the writings of the New Covenant. This theme is throughout the scripture. All, in fact, when you read the story of Israel, their hope is anchored in the prophetic promises of the new covenant that God is promising to bring. But what I want to mention is I understand that I'm a bit of a one string banjo when it comes to this. It's like the thing that I see all over the scripture. But I think that when we become one string banjos, we start to get a little hint about what maybe our calling might be uh, as, as a gift that God has given us to serve. And I know that I'm that way, but I, it's critical to me that we understand those contexts. This idea has been so transformational for me that I wanna share it with others. And we see the contrast begin in Genesis chapter three. That is where we see, whether you wanna take that as literal two people or you wanna read that as the metaphorical beginning of humanity, all of those things are honestly secondary to me than the truth that's being spoken through this story. And what we see there is there's an invitation either to intimacy or ideology. It's right there in Genesis chapter three. God shows up in the cool of the day to walk with Adam and Eve for as he had been doing for who knows how long because there aren't strict timelines in those stories. We have no idea how long the physical or I mean literal or metaphorical distances between Genesis 2 and Genesis chapter 3. But what we do see is we see a habit and the habit is that God shows up in the garden to walk and talk with his creation and what has happened and, and he has already made them in his image and he's breathed into their nostrils his spirit which 
made them living souls. This is what we're told in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And then they become convinced that God is holding out on them. They're, they are convinced that they are not like God, but they could be. They're not like God now, but they could be if they went and nourished themselves from this sea or this, from, from this tree or from this system called the knowledge of good and evil where you begin to divide and conquer and you label things good and things bad, then you've got good guys and bad guys and us and them. And all of human society is based on being nourished from that tree. That's the place from whence all of our ideologies flow, whether they be religious or non-religious. And that there's that invitation, walk with me, and they go in the other direction. And then you see whenever um, Israel has been delivered from their captivity in Egypt, and what they do is they come out of bondage from this system and they're brought into the desert to worship the Lord. And as, you, as we look at the history of that, of that um, founding of the Israelites, we see all of their documents, we read them and so forth, and, 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 and we make them religious documents, so things like the Ten Commandments. But one of the things that may be helpful is to understand in the context, the Ten Commandments are more like their constitution. They're not like the foundation of all religious practices. I'm, I'm not saying that they don't speak to our morality. I'm not saying, therefore, we should murder and steal. That's not what I mean. But I'm just saying that we've, we read those as religious documents, when in reality, these are the founding constitutional documents of this new nation. And, there's, and they were intended to be a nation that was utterly unique in all of the world. I mean, I, again, I'm not talking politics here. I'm just saying go back into Deuteronomy and Leviticus. The way their nation was intended to be set up, there would have never been billionaires and there would have never been the, um, the destitute poor because all debt was to be turned around every 50 years and gone back to the originals. I mean, th th their approach to communal living and even wealth distribution is something utterly unique. They never lived it, which is part of the reason why they come under judgment and deportation and the destruction of the temple. They never actually followed through on all of the points of that covenant, but that was the intention and that was the, that, that was the way in which God's heart was being expressed to those people. And he says, you're going to be like all, you're going to be, like he's, and he says this and in, 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 I think, oh, but better not quote because I'll get it wrong, but you can use the Google. Um, he says, I own the whole earth, but if you'll keep my covenant, you're going to be my special people. And then you go over to 1 Samuel. And there is the conflict in 1 Samuel that is a reimagining, in my opinion, of the conflict in Genesis chapter 3. Because here is the offer. I will be your king. You'll be my special people. I will be your king. And guess what Israel says? No, thank you. No, thank you. We want to be like all the other nations of the earth. We want a king to rule us, and we want a king to fight for us, we want our life to be mediated through that institutional representation. That's what the human heart does, and that's exactly what they do. Even though Samuel comes back and says, look, if you get what you wish, you know what's going to, you're going to be oppressed with taxation, and he's going to take your sons and daughters and have them for his armies and for his court, and nevertheless, they say, no, we want a king. You guys remember this story? And then Samuel's all upset, and you know, the prophets, I mean, they, they were most definitely the most uh, 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 mentally unhealthy of the religious figures in the Old Testament. I mean, they're angry, pouting, temper tantruming all the time. Samuel's this way, he's depressed. And you remember what God says to him? Samuel, dude, don't take it personal. They haven't rejected you. They've rejected me from being their king. But again, do you see this opportunity that's there? Either be the people who walk with God as their king or opt to a system, systematic approach where there's authority figures and structures and obligations, and that is what our heart goes to. And I, my burden is that what so-called modern-day Christians do the exact same thing. 
They come in with this theology where they celebrate grace, not deserving God's love. I could do nothing to earn it. You've just chosen me and graciously saved me. And then they're discipled into another system that tells them, okay, now for you to maintain this, you've got to believe this way and you've got to reject these beliefs because, be, because the Christians that believe those things, they're not real Christians. And here are the activities that you have to do now and you need to refrain from these activities. And we recreate these little mini systems that have this full power over our lives, but we invest them with a lot of authority. And pretty soon we are robbed of the joy of being a man or woman fully alive, birthed by the spirit of God with the presence of God dwelling in them. We go to churches and we go to places to meet with God all the while missing the fact that he has made you his home. You, God is wherever we are present. And I do think that those writings in, in Philippians and Colossians and Ephesians and in Galatians, Paul is trying to emphasize this reality against his ideological opponents, which are the Judaizers. And today you'll see why. I think that this, whatever they were struggling with was some sort of obligation to return to some sort of form of Judaism with their Christianity, like was the situation in Galatia. And you'll see that why in this part of the section. This is where it becomes very clear to me. I don't know, maybe it was a mixture between pagan and Judaism, but it seems like it's heavily relying on obligations of Judaism, and we'll read that in just a minute. But, but, but this is what they begin to do, and so this is the battle Paul is trying to fight, because that old covenant was part of the progression of humanity's understanding of God, but it was never meant to be the end game. In fact, back in the old covenant, God is already sending prophets to testify and, 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 and proclaim the coming of this new covenant. And look about their essential differences. In the new establishment of the new covenant, what you have is Moses acting as a mediator for the people. He goes up to the presence of God and he comes back down with tablets of stone and this is the law of God. But the law of God is written externally. So it's written externally, it's an authority above you, look to it and obey it, and here's the blessings for obeying it, look to it and disobey it, and here's the punishment or the curses for disobeying it. But it's external, and then they have an external system of priest and king and prophet mediating this reality of this old covenant, all the while they're telling people, all of the trappings of your old covenant religion don't impress Yahweh at all. The prophets show up and say, I hate your fasting days. I hate your holidays. I hate your meetings. It's just like a bunch of noise to me because you've made your religion vertical about all the ritual practices you pursue to stay connected to me or to please me, but you have no horizontal morality. And that's what this is all about. I don't care that you fast. I care whether or not you share your food with the hungry, you see? And he says now there's a day coming where this exclusive external covenant is going to be an inclusive internal covenant. And that's what the prophets say. Isaiah says it, Jeremiah says it, and it's celebrated again in the book of Hebrews, which is this. What's the characteristic, the first characteristic of the new covenant? What happens to the people of God in the new covenant? Does anyone remember? Where do the laws, the laws of God get delivered once again? But where do they get delivered? Right here. You see, the full, the the old covenant isn't bad, it is wrong, but it is incomplete. The New Testament is very crystal clear on that idea. In fact, we're going to read a passage today that says, in fact, all that was was a shadow. But the substance that the shadow was pointing to is Christ. And now he has come. He has established a new covenant in which God, it's an inclusive covenant. God pours his spirit out on all mankind and he writes the laws in our hearts, which is why Paul will go on in Galatians to say, the only law you need is love your neighbor as yourself. And then the Beatles reminded us many years later, it's all you need, baby. But he says that, that's all you need. And you do that by what? Keeping in step with the spirit. And do you remember what Paul says in Galatians 1 or 2 when he talks about the revelation of Christ? He doesn't talk about the time when the Spirit of God revealed Christ to him. What's the language he uses? When God revealed Christ in him. When God revealed Christ in me. This is the invitation. But my friends, just with all humanity throughout history, we experience the same threats to our faith 
as people of God have always experienced. So my overarching thought that really for our entire study of the book of Colossians, but particularly for this morning is this, the old covenant represents a God above you understanding of God. The new covenant reveals the God in you reality of God. Now, once again, what are you saying? God doesn't rule that there's higher, th- go, go ahead and just hold that there for just a few minutes, would you? Um, would you, are you, are you saying that God's not above us? I'm not saying that. Again, I am not saying that religious systems and old covenant representation, that that's evil in and of itself, but it can go awry and it, it can be made into an idol that takes us away from the heart of God. No, God above you is a true reality. He is the source of everything we see and literally his present spirit and therefore love saturates every single centimeter of the cosmos. Most certainly he is above you. However, the trick that the, the, the missing piece is that was hidden until the fullness of time is this God above you is the God that has always been in you. This is why one of my favorite quotations is beware the man whose God lives in the clouds. That God is distant and he is above and he's all about demanding and obedience. No, your God doesn't primarily exist in the clouds. Your God exists in your soul. He is the God in you, Christ in you hope of glory. So old covenant represents a God above you understanding of God. And that's true of, of the, the, the information we get from the Jewish scriptures, but that's true of other religious systems as well. Whereas the new covenant is revealing a God in you reality of God. So let's look and see how this breaks down. Here's Paul's argument as we walk through Colossians chapter two, verses eight through 23. The hate through 23, really the overall point is don't let anyone judge you or exclude you. This is what he's saying. He says, listen, now that, remember he takes Colossians 1 to create this magnificent vision of the universal risen Christ that is nearly too difficult for our minds to even comprehend. And he presents this vision and he's saying, now because this is who not only you belong to, but this is who holds you together and this is who who lives in you, therefore you don't submit to rules and regulations where people are judging you and telling you you're excluded if you don't practice this particular outward form of spirituality or practice of a belief system. It's what he says. So in Galatians 8 through 15, his emphasis is the reason why is you're already complete in Christ. This is why that discipleship that focuses on what you are not is misguided. Discipleship should be a growth in the revelation of who you have become, who you are, or even more importantly, who Christ is in you. But so his argument is you're already complete in Christ. So therefore, in verses 8 through 10, ideological or there are ideological and religious rivals to Christ to whom you must not submit. And then he says, they're going to press on you an ideology that says that you've got to follow the law and be circumcised. This is why I think it's primarily some sort of Judaizing uh, challenge that's happening in Colossians. But what he says is, I'm not necessarily disagreeing with that, but what I'm saying is it's already happened. You've already been circumcised in Christ. You have already been freed from the law's demands. And here's the big kicker for dispensational Christians in Southern Oklahoma that are waiting for the good stuff to happen when we die. You've already died and been risen with him. You have already been seated with him. Why are you standing around in buildings waiting to hear a trumpet so you can fly away and be with Christ when you've already been seated with him? This has already been accomplished. That's what he's going to say. Are you sure, Artie? I'm glad you asked. Let's read it. Galatians, I did it again. Next time I'm just going to read rain shoes and we're going to be in Galatians the rest of the time. Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Simply don't be taken by ideological rivals, which is what we talked about last week. Be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit based on human tradition, based on the elements of the world rather than Christ. Doesn't it sound like our man-made denominational traditions? Maybe that's going too far. That's just how, that's kind of what I read into it. Uh, Verse nine, for the entire fullness 
of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ, and you have been filled by him who is head over every ruler and authority. Now think about this, for example. All of our traditions have rooted in them some great man of God or woman of God that probably had a real sincere revelation and a response to the Spirit, and then we build traditions around their teachings and so forth, right? So let's, for example, I'm not picking on anyone, it's just the one that's clearest in my mind, one of the denominational histories that I have appreciated because of its work of redemption in America is the history of the Methodist Church in America. But the point is this, John Wesley was used powerfully by God, but guess what? John Wesley also had a Lord to whom he was submitted, who ruled over him. Guess who that Lord was? The risen Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul's point is, yes, learn from John Wesley, be inspired by John Wesley, and I've, given, I've created you to live in a community of mutual benefit for one another, so by all means, learn from him. However, you don't submit to him, you submit to the Lord that he's submitting to. You are already filled with the Lord that he served. That's what Paul's saying. He's already the rule over every other authority. So, so, and that's the one that lives in you. Therefore, can't you see how silly it is to submit yourself to one of his subordinates when he, the king, actually lives in you? Is that, is that kind of, is that starting to solidify here? This is what he's saying. Uh, the entire fullness of God dwelt in him and you've been filled by him who is head over every other rule and authority. And then he goes on to say these words, and I'm gonna tell you, I'm not gonna get too far into all the complicated details of this for us, but you're welcome to use the Google and or if you want to hear about the commentaries that I read each week, I, I love them. I love the background in this, but I'm trying to do something a little bit uh, more of the forest rather than the individual trees here because these ideas are pretty complex. But what he says is this, verse 11, you were also circumcised in him with a circumcision not done by hands by putting off the body of flesh in the circumcision of Christ. So what, what he's essentially communicating is this, if there are teachers that are saying, now that you have faith in Christ in order to really be the full participants in the people of God, you now need to seal that covenant with the sign of the old covenant, which was circumcised. Circumcision. That's why Paul has some very vehement things to say about those teachers of the first century that were telling other Christians that they're supposed to participate in symbols of the old covenant in, in, in order to full, fully uh, be part of the new covenant. Go, go, Galatians, I mean, he's, he's very vehement. In fact, he actually says in Galatians something that's pretty audacious. He said, I, I wish they'd just go ahead and cut everything off. That's what he says in Galatians. I didn't say that. I didn't learn that from Mozart. That's what Paul said uh, in Galatians. That, that's, how, that's how vehement he is about this idea. And why? Why? Because, my friends, when we start looking to old covenant systems in order to compromise with new covenant realities, we put ourselves under bondages again, and that is 